Uh, welcome to the first uh, regular meeting of the new City Council. Um, we're going to begin with the with everyone turning off their cell phones, please, or put them on silent. And then next, we're going to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a number of items on our consent agenda, and um, I need to address a couple of changes, and I think there might be um, one or two that have to be pulled out. Um, Maggie, on the community meeting uh, schedule, there was a request to move up the South Asheville okay. community meeting. Um, the next scheduled community meeting is North Asheville, so Maybe we could switch north and south. Does that seem agreeable? In addition, under item I, which is the um, assignment of boards and commissions, members and liaisons, there, I have the following changes. Um, the mayor to be a member of the River Redevelopment Commission um, currently, it's Jan on the list. And then also the Boards and Commissions Committee to be made up of Vice Mayor uh, Jan and Chris and Cecil to serve as liaison to the Housing Authority. And I think, Gordon, you had, and Maggie, you'll remind me if there's any other technical changes I needed to pull out there. I think, Gordon, you had one that you needed to pull out. No. Uh, just, just, I'll just, I just need to make mention of this uh, regarding items M and N. Uh, I just wanted to disclose that uh, for the Eagle Marketplace project, my wife's sister's husband uh, was hired by Weaver Cook, who's the construction company for that project as one of the superintendents on the project. And I just wanted to disclose that and uh, wanted to check in with Martha mm -hmm. about uh, any sort of conflict that might right. constitute. Uh, Councilman Smith and I discussed this, and I think we discussed it at the HCD meeting, and I determined that he does not have a conflict of interest mm -hmm. sufficient to warrant him recusing himself. Okay, thank you. And Gwen, did you have Relative one? to N1 or, or N2, I would just like to see that see the report every month. Uh, Kath, Kathy Ball had told me they're going to get a report every month and I'd like to be copied on that. All right. And Kathy is nodding and that is a yes. And to be clear, that's uh, distributed by email or on paper to staff, not necessarily a, a, a public report. Okay. Sure. And one, one more comment uh, around uh, item N2 for the um, uh, Oh, it's not into. It's the the piece uh, authorizing the funding for the project manager. Into. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about that. That I think it's great that we're going to have somebody there to, uh, since there is a lot of public money in here to uh, help uh, maximize transparency for the public around all of that. I'll also say that this is a project on a really tight timeline, and that project manager, I hope, will be very helpful uh, to the folks who are trying to bring that thing in on time and won't in any way inhibit the progress of the project. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. second. We have a tie for second. <laughs> uh, all right, any other questions or comments? And. Would anyone from the public like to make a comment at all on the motion to approve the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Oh, okay. We have dispensed with the consent agenda. Next, we have the presentation of the financial quarterly report. Okay. 
Okay, good evening, Mayor and Council. Tony McDowell, City Budget Manager, here to present the first quarter financial report. Uh, you all have copies of the full report uh, with your, that came out with your packet agenda. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about the full report. I do have a few slides to go over uh, that summarizes our results from the first quarter, so I'll run through those quickly. Um, before I get into those results, I just wanted to share a little economic data that I came across a few weeks ago that I thought was interesting. Uh, this was some information that was presented to the North Carolina Metropolitan Mayor's Coalition on November 13th. It was some data that was pulled together by uh, some economists at PNC uh, based on some uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis statistics. And it's, it's, a, it's a, bit, a bit of a busy chart, but what it shows is uh, on the, the vertical axis is employment change since the, the start of the recession. And on the horizontal axis, you have uh, real GDP or economic output change since the recession started. And just to look at things in quadrants here, we have the major North Carolina metropolitan areas uh, depicted here on the, on the screen. And these, these areas up here in the right, upper right-hand quadrant uh, are the cities that have recovered uh, the most uh, since the recession started. So you've got Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham, Fayetteville, Jacksonville. They've all seen uh, their economic output grow to where it's now fully recovered and higher than it was before the recession started. And their employment also is now higher than it was before the recession started. Those cities down here in the lower left-hand quadrant, those are the cities that are, that are lagging behind. Uh, your traditional manufacturing centers like Winston-Salem, Hickory, Burlington, uh, they still have not recovered either on economic growth or on the employment side. You'll notice Asheville is right here sort of in the middle, and we're very close to where the U.S. Uh, average is. Uh, we've recovered. Our GDP is now higher than it was uh, in 2007 when the recession started. But as of the third quarter of this year, our employment was still not quite back to where it was before the recession started. So uh, I think there's some interesting, interesting information about the economy. We've been hearing a lot in the press the last few weeks about how the economy is picking up steam nationally. So we expect some of these, you know, these data to continue to show positive trends in the coming months for the North Carolina and the local economy as well. Um, the last thing I'll say about this slide before I move on, notice Charlotte and, and, and Raleigh, Durham are the big dots here on the screen. And it, it's not, it doesn't say this in here, but about 51% of the state's economy uh, is, is, with, is represented by those two metropolitan areas combined. And so what goes on in Charlotte and Raleigh has a really big effect on the North Carolina economy as a whole, and it impacts us here in Asheville as well, because we get about a third of our sales tax revenue from statewide collections. So if things are going well in those two big metropolitan areas, it impacts our sales tax revenue here in Asheville as well. So anyway, interesting information, I thought. Mm -hmm. um, I'll move on to our uh, first quarter results. Uh, this is our dashboard that you all have grown accustomed to see us uh, presenting. Uh, this is revenue information for the general fund as of September 30th. And I'll just quickly run through these, these particular items that are shown here. Property tax at the moment we believe is going to come in on budget. Uh, we'll be getting additional property tax, property tax information from the county tax assessor's office in the next few weeks that will show us what the official uh, tax based data or, or official assessed valuation is for the current fiscal year. So we'll know a whole lot more. Uh, in the next few weeks about where we think our property taxes are going to come in for the year. And we'll report back to you all at the second quarter report on, on those results. Sales taxes, uh, right now we, we show them trending below target. We were fairly aggressive during the budget process uh, with our estimates on sales taxes for the current year. Uh, we, we saw growth last year of a little over 5%. We budgeted uh, roughly the same for this year. Uh, and, and even though the economy has been picking up steam, the League, of the League of Municipalities is still estimating that sales tax growth will only be around 3% this year. So until we get a little bit further into the fiscal year and know a little bit more about where the economy is heading, uh, we're, we're, we're signaling a little bit of a caution on sales tax revenue at this point. But we'll, again, we'll know a whole lot more as we move on. We only have about three months worth of data at this point for sales taxes. State utility taxes, we believe, will come in on budget. Uh, just a reminder, that's about a $7 million revenue for us. It's the third biggest revenue in the general fund after property and sales taxes. And we've gotten our first quarter payment there, and we do think we're headed, uh, we think we will come in on budget for that revenue. PAL bill, which goes to fund uh, street uh, maintenance expenditures, uh, something we get from the state. It's about $2.5 million. We've gotten our first 
uh, first of two payments that we get every year for Powell Bill. Uh, this year's revenue is up about 1.6%, and we think we're going to come in over budget by around $40,000 uh, that for that revenue. Fire protection revenue, it's the, the one that's in red, and as you all know, the reason that's in red was uh, after we adopted the budget uh, and for the current year, we found out that the town of Biltmore Forest would be canceling its fire contract with us, which uh, is resulting in a revenue loss of about $600,000 in the current year. Um, and that's something certainly we'll need to keep in mind as we move into next year's budget process as we, we start talking about uh, revenue growth and replacing that revenue in next fiscal year. And then finally, development fees, uh, again, on, on a very positive note there, through the first, uh, half, first quarter of the year, first 25% of the year, uh, DSD, development services revenues, are 39% of budget. Uh, so they're coming in well over budget. We think uh, if those trends continue, they may end up over budget by about $300,000 this year. So that'll help, it, help, help make up some of the loss uh, in the fire protection area. Uh, overall, at the end of the first quarter, we have our little arrow here pointing uh, sort of between the yellow and green right now, we think revenues overall in the general fund are going to come in right at budget at this point or maybe slightly under. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll have a whole lot more information for you all when we get to the second quarter report. <coughs> On the expenditure side of the budget, uh, oops, did I go through? Okay, there we go. Um, just four areas we'd highlight here, personnel cost management, utilities, fuel, health care. Obviously, there are a lot of other things we spend money on, the general fund, contracts, materials, those kind of things that are, that are really more under our control uh, than, than these types of items. Uh, they're all looking, looking good at this point through the first quarter. Uh, personnel cost management, the reason we highlight that is we did uh, assume some salary savings in the current year. We we're going to hold some positions vacant in order to achieve a balanced budget. And so through the first quarter, it looks like uh, we're on target to achieve those savings that we had outlined during the budget process. Uh, utilities, obviously, it's very early in the year. We look like we're on budget right now. We'll know more as we move through the winter and see whether it's a colder or warmer winter than normal. Uh, fuel, and fleet maintenance ex fuel and fleet maintenance expenses uh, are, are doing better than budget at this point, which is the opposite of what we have been seeing in recent years. Right now, through the first quarter, uh, at 25% of the year, we had only spent 22% of the budget on fuel and fleet maintenance. So that's a, a good positive trend there. Uh, and we're seeing uh, uh, continuing good trends in health care as well. So overall, we think we're in a good shape on the expenditure side in the general fund budget and in good shape overall at the end of the first quarter. We were a little bit concerned at the start of the year, back in July and August. Again, we were looking at the loss of the Biltmore Forest fire revenue. We also had the landslide expenses, and we did not know at that time whether we're going to get FEMA reimbursement for those expenses or not. We do now know that we are. And so uh, some of the caution that we were, that we were raising and concerns we had early in the fiscal year, um, we're not as concerned now at this point. So we think things are going pretty well in the general fund. On the enterprise funds, um, most of those are doing well, uh, either as a, a coming in better than budget or on budget, uh, reflecting trends that we've seen over the last few years in most of those funds. Uh, we did highlight the transit fund in, in yellow, and that's simply because, uh, as you all know, the state and federal revenues for the transit fund have, are continuing to go down. Our expenses uh, are, are, are holding steady, and so the, the, that's one that we'll have to continue to monitor. We had some uh, expenses last year, late in the year, that, that drove the fund over budget, and so we're going to keep a close eye on that one this year as we move along. And then finally, uh, just some upcoming <coughs> budget items. We're, we're sort of on the cusp of the, the, the budget season kicking off. I know it's hard to believe, but it's been uh, about six months since the budget was adopted. And so we'll be kicking off the FY14-15 budget process very soon. Uh, and just a couple of items that we'll be coming to you all to talk about shortly include uh, the development of a 10-year capital improvement program. Uh, Kathy Ball spearheading that, that effort, and we're working on that right now. Uh, have some meetings with departments this week to start talking about potential projects uh, and, and those kind of items. And you'll be hearing a lot more from us on that over the next few months. Uh, departments have also been working on proposed fee changes for next fiscal year. Uh, we'll be bringing those to the Finance Committee and eventually to the full council in the January, February, March time frame. So uh, look for those to come forward. Uh, we also, departments will begin working on their operating budgets uh, as soon as we get back from the Christmas holidays, uh, the start of January, they'll start entering their budgets and they'll spend the month of January 
uh, in, internally working on those budgets and then turning those into the budget office at the end of January. And we'll begin our review at that point. And then finally, we'll be coming back to you all in February with our second quarter financial report. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Uh, Tony, do we know what the re uh, FEMA reimbursement will be and, and when that is coming? Uh, I'm not sure on the timing of, of the reimbursement. I think we anticipate that the, the reimbursement will cover uh, most, if not almost, if not all of our expenses that we had for those slides. And I don't know, Kathy, if you know any more about that. Then. There are, um, we think that we'll get all of the expenses that we have paid out within this budget year. There are some of the expenses that we think we'll get reimbursed for, but we haven't made those construction improvements yet. So if we, if we do those improvements for some of the major slides in the spring of the year, then we likely would not be reimbursed until the next uh, fiscal year. So, th but everything up until this point should be reimbursed within this budget. Any other questions? Thank you, Tony. Thank you. All right, the next um, item on the agenda is the Planning and Economic Development Committee Chair Report. So, um, you all will let me know how you care to do these uh, quarterly chair reports from our subcommittees, but uh, I was inclined to attach the summary and just leave it at that. But um, since we, since there's a bunch of stuff on here, maybe I'll just <laughs> highlight a couple of points. Um, the, the Planning and Economic Development Committee, which will now be chaired by Mark Hunt, um, but this last quarter I chaired, uh, so I will just share that the committee um, revised the right-of-way uh, cut ordinance. This has to do with replacing of utility poles. If you see in Asheville, we're plagued by uh, brand new utility poles located next to still standing, not functioning utility poles. And so we're trying to um, get away from, our, from uh, this occurrence where we have uh, unused leftover utility poles still sticking out of the sidewalk. Um, we also looked at uh, the 2025 comprehensive plan and the potential need to update that plan. Um, and uh, several other, other things, but uh, just to highlight a, a couple more things, the Planning Economic Development Commission looked at um, the process for launching a new signature special event uh, now that Bellshare is no longer going to be a part of um, Asheville City s functions, what would be the next, uh, the next signature event? And also initiated a review of our economic development incentives, which were put in place um, a few years ago, but now that they've been in place, looking at whether or not they're being utilized properly and how they need to be changed. Uh, the Haywood Road Corridor Form-Based Code Project, which is humming along very well, um, we received an, uh, an update on that. Um, the final of that project will probably be coming to this council in the spring. Um, and we looked at the Charlotte Street Corridor uh, possibilities for change and um, still looking forward to, to some more ideas on that uh, before any any initiative is seized upon. Are you here? Yes. No. Uh, Mayor, Man uh, Mayor Manheimer. There, I got to say it. <laughs> wow. Um, Mouthful. From what, from your comment ahead of that, uh, you were you seem to be suggesting that we uh, simply distribute the quarterly reports rather than report them out. I think that really, the the pertinent issues that come before our committees end up here at council and that's the time when the chair could address what was discussed in the committee. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more pertinent then than, than going back over it uh, quarterly. So I would uh, make a motion that we distribute, if, if that's necessary, that we distribute them as information rather than public re uh, uh, oral reports. Yes. I personally would agree with that. <laughs> okay, we, I think we just have a super majority right there in agreement with that. Okay. Your motion's been seconded and approved. Are, are you, I can't get through to my links either. Are I you all having, fixing? I'll, I'll. okay, she's, all right. We're, ha we're just fraught with technical difficulties tonight. We probably have a, uh, somebody who has packed into our system. <laughs> um, all right, we're gonna begin the public hearing portions, uh, portion of the agenda. And 
the first uh, item on the agenda is the what what our, we're just short term calling the Chestnut Street project. It is not to be heard tonight, and I need a motion to continue it to January twenty eighth, two thousand and fourteen. So moved. Second. All right. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. We need, do we need public comment on a motion to continue? Yes. Do we need mo public comment on a motion to continue? You, all, you have done it in the past. Yes. Okay. Um, before we voted on that, <laughs> would anyone like to offer any public comment on the motion to continue the Chestnut Street project until January 28th, 2014? No. Okay. We'll try it again. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, this is also something of interest to me that we actually have public comment on absolutely every single motion we make, unlike every other city council in the state. <laughs> but I appreciate that that, that uh, opportunity was there. The next public hearing is um, a public hearing to consider a conditional use permit for the construction of new facilities at Asheville Middle School located at 197 South French Broad Avenue and Jessica Bernstein will be making the presentation. Mayor, before Jessica come forward, let me remind Council that this is a conditional use permit. As such, it is a quasi-judicial uh, hearing. So the petitioner is entitled to uh, an impartial board or council. So if any council member may have had some discussion with the developer or have any information that you have acquired uh, prior to this hearing today, it is important that you disclose it. I will disclose that my sixth grader goes to Asheville Middle School. <laughs> All right. Anyone wishing to speak? Oh. <laughs> um, anyone wishing to speak at all, if you even think you might want to speak, if, you, if you're not even here for this issue, but you might be compelled after you hear this presentation to speak about it, please come forward to be sworn out of an abundance of caution. So for our public hearings, the staff will present and then the developer, in this case, um, will offer a presentation and then public comment may be made. Individuals will have three minutes to offer their comments. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council, members of the public. Uh, the project site consists of a just under 26 acre parcel that everyone is, is uh, most everyone is quite familiar with, located at 197 South French Broad Avenue. It's zoned, as you can see, split zoned, uh, mostly institutional, with a small portion of RM8 to the north. That area is not uh, built upon, it's vacant. Adjacent parcels in the area also include RM8 zoning, um, institutional office, and CI, actually. This is the site of the existing Nashville Middle School. Um, the properties that are surrounding include residential and office uses. Down in the CI portion, as you can see, um, that, that's down in the, uh, towards the River Arts District, and there are some warehousing and manufacturing uses down there, but it's, it's really separated by grade and, and, and doesn't really interact with this site. The proposal that you have is to demolish the existing school building uh, and rebuild a new facility in the same location. The new facility is a three-story uh, building, about 175,000 square feet, and there'll be 67 classrooms. Uh, you can see on the exhibit map, but uh, the existing building is sort of in this location, and, and this is the location of the new facility. The uses that are the sports uses um, on the rear of the site won't be touched, won't change at all. It's really just kind of flip-flopping the building and parking locations with new um, access from South French Broad. 
and that will be probably the biggest positive, one of the biggest positive changes to the site. And there's a significant amount of vehicular backup right now along South French Broad. And as you can see, there's two separate uh, drop-offs. The first that's in red to the north of the site is for um, it's the parent drop-off or the, the vehicle drop-off, and the second is for school buses, and they can also access the school bus parking area you know, to the rear or southern end of the site. There is existing access um, to the site via Charles Street, and that will remain. Um, Charles Street is shown, proposed to be one way south of Timothy. There's sidewalks that will be uh, along South French Broad, 10 feet wide, and also a sidewalk provided along Charles Street, and that one would be six feet in width. And uh, pedestrian path interior to the site, connecting both the parking areas to the building as well as that sidewalk from Charles Street that will um, connect into the, the building facility. There's parking in two locations, 106 spaces in front of the school building, and that bus parking with 28 additional spaces that I showed you to the south. Landscaping, as required by the UDO, is provided on site with significantly more than the open space, and a lot of that is, is through those sports fields. Um, one thing that you may have noticed in the, in the staff report is that, the, and uh, most of council is aware of, is the Klingman Forest Greenway is in draft form right now. Um, so there, there's definitely potential connection points in and out of the site. Um, when I spoke with uh, Al Kaufman, our parks department, he felt that it's still in enough of a draft form that we couldn't pin down those locations, but the school is working very closely with the uh, city staff, and they, uh, that is absolutely part of the discussion and will continue to be so. The project was approved with conditions by the TRC on October 21st. It also received unanimous recommendation for approval by the Planning and Zoning Commission on November 6th. I have received communication from one neighbor who lives up on Charles Street, um, north of Timothy, and she noted to me that there's already significant backup when cars are coming and going, both on Charles and Timothy as well as back out onto South French Broad, and she just expressed her concern um, that that's an existing problem and, and that she was concerned that it will continue. As I mentioned, these loop drives are really intended to alleviate a lot of that congestion from South French Broad, but that point up at Timothy and Charles is still an active access point that can be used. Uh, staff does recommend approval of the project as proposed. It complies with our city goals and objectives. It's an investment in education and supportive to the community, so we recommend approval. And that completes my report, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? I just had one. Can you describe the cross hatching and the um, portion that the fronts? Fr yeah, that area. What what is um, what is that now, and what would it be? That is right now part of the school building okay. in the small front yard, and that will just be open space. Open space, not. Okay. Um, Got it. And it, it was there. Um, an interest in pushing the parking back and having the open space front the roadway? I'm not sure if that was a part of what the school board and their design team looked into, not when it was submitted. Okay. Um, any, any other questions? No? Okay. Just a, oh. just a quick question. With all of the open space that they have, um, they've got a lot of flexibility as to where they're going to be putting their school garden. I just didn't know if it was already designated. You know, I, I don't believe that I saw that on the plans, and maybe the design team will have a little more insight on that. Okay. Uh, Esther. Yes. Just uh, a question about the Cleveland Forest Greenway. The conversation that's ongoing, is that about uh, security, or is it about connectivity to it, or is there the, that option in there? I haven't been a part of those discussions, but I know that I would imagine that all of all of the above. All right, any other questions? Just one comment. I'm just very grateful to the Buckingham County Board of Commissioners for uh, for being there for the Asheville City Schools and for the students of the of the city. And this is a great example of the kind of partnerships that we have to have to be able to keep moving forward. Thanks. Okay, we're going to hear from. Uh, 
Well, I use the word developer, but I, guess, I don't know if that's right. <laughs> Go ahead. Good afternoon. Jacqueline Hallam, board chair at for City Schools. I'm Chad Robertson with Clark Nixon. We're the architects on the project. And he's going to give you all the technical information. I wanted to tell you that um, thank you for allowing us to be here. This is part of the process of the en entitlement um, funding. And so this is something that we have to do. But I also want to thank council and congratulate um, the new council and Gwen um, and your seat and re-election for the others and Mayor Manhammer. We're all going to have to practice that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And so about Asheville Middle School, and this uh, was around 50 years ago. I actually remember that. I was around myself, and it was South Finch Broad High School. So it is due time for, um, for that building to come down and for us to get a new school. So as part of that process, that's why we're here. I'm not going to take up the time and going to let the technical person come in. Any questions on my part that you have of the school district? Thank you. Yeah. Building to engage and inspire students and transform our community. That, that's been our goal as we started this project and as we've worked with the school system for going about a year and a half right now. Um, let's see if I can make this advance. There we go. I, I just want to review a little bit of the information that Jessica showed you already. Uh, so the existing site, uh, the building in red is the existing middle school. This is the baseball field and the football field located in this area. And just to give you a little perspective, there's about 26 acres available on this site. Most middle schools are about 60. So we're, it's a very urban site, it's very dense, and of that 26 acres, about 12 of it is usable because of the amount of topography uh, that we have along the back side of the site. So we're really wedging this building in there, and, and part of the challenge has been to keep that existing school in operation throughout the construction process. This is one of the earlier sketches that we did and underneath uh, this sketch is the existing building. Uh, the new building will be constructed in its entirety and then the old building will be demolished uh, and a new park will be installed at the front of the site where the existing school is located uh, in this area and uh, Councilman Smith you ask where is the garden going to be located and it would be located in this area right here. We haven't defined it exactly but we're, we're working on that but it will be a green space uh, off of South French Broad. Um, so we really are we're wedging this building in there. We've gone vertical with the building rather than spreading it out uh, so it is a very urban condition that we have. This is what the new school will look like on the site. Uh, this is the building as Jessica pointed out. This will be three stories. This portion of the building will be two stories. Uh, parking in the front and then an open green space uh, just off of South French Broad. Uh, we focused uh, a lot on traffic. If you go down South French Broad 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to be stuck at Hilliard. Uh, so one of the goals that we had was, was getting that traffic off of South French Broad and we've accomplished it through these loops, uh, one for parent drop off and the other uh, for the bus activities. The, the building's really designed to be a hub uh, for the community. Right now, that school is a hub for that area. Folks use the auditoriums, they use the gymnasiums throughout the entire time uh, in the after hours. And we've organized the building so that the gymnasium can be operated after hours. It can become that community center uh, for the building. Security has been a strong focus for the design process. We've, we've got the building oriented so that the, uh, the administrative area really acts as that security block or security wall coming into the building. You will have to be buzzed in to the remainder of the building. Each one of the grade levels can be locked down so that in the event of an emergency, we'll have that capability of, of securing each one of those grade levels. Uh, there's a media center that really is the heart of the building. Everything is focused around that, uh, all the classrooms, gymnasium, cafeteria spin off of that heart and we've really focused on that being uh, an important portion of the building. As you move up into the building, seventh grade will occupy, occupy the sev uh, second level. There's con uh, 
career and technical education that will be located in this area. Uh, there's a lobby space and, and a bridge that connects these two areas. The third level is very similar. We put the sixth graders, gave them the high ground so that uh, they are above everyone else. Uh, sixth graders are on the top, seventh graders are on the middle, and then eighth graders are close to the principal's office. And as the principal <laughs> Stellinger said, she said, I want to keep those guys close to me so I can keep an eye on them. <laughs> These are a few of the images that we have put together. Uh, one of the ideas is, is the school uh, opening its arms to the community and uh, inviting folks in. Where we're standing right now is about the auditorium of the existing building. So this green space, um, if you if were there right now, you'd be standing in the auditorium. Now we're looking back to the new entry. The gymnasium is located here, uh, and this is the classroom wing. This is just moving in a little closer. We're providing covered parking, or covered uh, seating areas for folks as they're being picked up after school and for uh, bus drop off and pick up. Uh, so this is the gymnasium again. The materials that we're using on the building are focusing on durability and longevity. This, the current building has been there for almost 50 years and that's our goal is to create a building that will be there for another 50 years. This is the back, uh, the south end of the classroom. We've taken great efforts to ensure that natural daylighting will be available to all of the classroom spaces. We're capitalizing on the orientation of the building uh, so that we can get that natural lighting deep into the classrooms. Sustainability has been a focus of the project, creating a project that is sustainable, it's affordable, and it's smart uh, with the way that we're, we're creating the affordable component, or the uh, uh, sustainable component of it. We've also designed the building so that it could be expanded later on. Uh, currently, there's about 785 students that are enrolled. We imagine that the, through growth over the next uh, 50 years, they could accommodate at least 900 students. We've also designed this area here so that uh, eventually an auditorium space could be added uh, if they needed to or if they chose to. Uh, the gymnasium is located here, and this is the career and technical education component. The cafeteria is located in the back and from that position in the cafeteria it, it, it is an amazing view. That's one of the most beautiful views in Asheville looking back uh, across the river. And I will be happy to answer any questions that you might have on the project. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, one question I have is uh, so there's the new loops for drop-off. Yes. Uh, but the, the amount of traffic coming in off of French Broad and going back out on French Broad is still going to remain about the same. It, I mean, right? That's correct. So it's just a, it's accommodating more cars in the loop than we now accommodate? That's correct. It's, it's getting the, the, where the queuing is occurring right now is actually on the street. Uh, drop off and pick up is very limited space in front of the school. So we're bringing that deep into the site to give some extra queuing space. But the traffic load is, is basically the same. <coughs> Maggie, I cannot open my link anymore. Again, I don't know what's going on. I, I had a quick question about the auditorium slash gym. Yes. Um, you know, right now the middle school has an auditorium and a couple of gyms, um, and you know they have a huge band program. Tell me how the gym will double as an auditorium. How, how will that how will that work? We let me get back to that plan. The, one of the, when we first started the program, uh, or when we first started the design of the building, the program did have a, a full-blown auditorium mm -hmm. space that would seat almost 600 people in there. One of the cost-saving measures that we needed to implement what was com combining the gymnasium space with the auditorium. And so what we've created really is a gymatorium. Uh, the gym will be located here. We're creating a stage, an, an elevated stage uh, at the front part of the building. There's storage on either side of that. Uh, the gym will be able to accommodate seating that can be moved in and out, and we're accommodating that uh, in these storage spaces uh, on either side, the movable chairs. Uh, it, more than anything, it is a cost-saving measure. But again, we've designed uh, an area right here for a future auditorium. 
And is that uh, just to follow up on that? Is there um, is that gym roughly the size of one of the two gyms that's at the current middle school? No, it's actually the same size as almost the same size as both of them put together. Oh, okay. Uh, this is a regulation size middle school gymnasium. The two gyms that we have currently over there are one of them is very small. The other one is is not regulation size uh, mm -hmm. for a middle school. Okay. Maybe just a, a comment on the value engineering point here, and, and I'll, I want to start by thanking the members of the Board of Education and, and the architectural firm and all involved at making this as efficient as possible. But so the public will know, uh, state law uh, uh, mandates or pr prescribes the amount of funding that can flow to the Asheville City School District and the Buncombe County School District based on popul uh, school uh, enrollment numbers and the county commission has a fixed budget based on a certain percentage of sales tax collection that can be allocated for capital construction like this to the two school districts in the county and uh, county staff as uh, councilman smith pointed out uh, county commissioners and, and county staff have worked very hard hand in hand with you folks and some folks here on city staff and Council to, to work through this. How do we how do we afford uh, good facilities in the time frame under the constraints of this law? So I, I, I mainly want to offer a thanks for that, but also to let the public know that there, there's a very specific formula and constrained process for how we can afford to do this. And I'm delighted that we're moving forward on the timetable we are. Thank you. Any questions? Any other questions? Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else here wishing to speak on this? Uh, and I'm, let me just make sure I get my order right. Um, do, we, do we need to open it up for public comment at this point? Yes. Mm -hmm. And do, do, are we required to have a motion prior to opening up for public comment, or can we go ahead and have public comment? You can go ahead and have the Okay. Um, all right. Any, anyone wishing to speak on this item? Okay. All right, any other um, questions or comments from members of council? I, I'll just offer that I'm absolutely thrilled that this is happening and I, um, I'm grateful to our county commissioners for um, prioritizing and valuing this project and, uh, and voting for it in our strange structure where we have an Asheville City School District but our county commissioners build the buildings. I recognize we all need to work together to make these things happen, and that's what's happening here, and that's really exciting. Um, I agree, and I move to approve the conditional use permit for the construction of new facilities at Asheville Middle School. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. Thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda is the Asheville Area Riverfront Redevelopment Commission, and this item is not ready yet, so I need a motion to continue it to January 14th. So, so. <laughs> Second. Okay, that's January 14th, 2014. Um, I have a motion and a second. Would anyone like to comment on the motion to continue the next item, the Asheville Area Riverfront Redevelopment Commission to January 14th, 2014. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, the next item on our agenda is a public hearing to consider conditional zoning of 12.33 acres for a project known as the Avalon located on Sweeten Creek Road from Industrial District to RM16 Multifamily High Density District Conditional Zoning for the development of eight multifamily buildings and one clubhouse building. Jessica, you're doing all the work here. You're back up, okay. Thank you. Uh, as the mayor just mentioned, this is a condi conditional zoning from industrial to RM16 for a multifamily residential development. The project site, as you can see on the exhibit map here, is uh, currently vacant, a little over 12 acres, located on Sweeten Creek Road. Uh, it's a little hard to get context um, as zoomed is in as we are here, but it's just a bit north of Airport Road, so it's quite south um, in the city limits. 
Adjacent zoning, as you can see, includes commercial industrial to the north, RM16 and institutional to the east, uh, industrial to the south, and then the um, western boundary is the Norfolk Southern Rail Line, as well as CB2 zoning over on Hendersonville Road. There are a variety of uses in this area. Um, the uses to the north include some storage, office, manufacturing. Uh, to the south, there's also some distribution and manufacturing-esque uses um, and office as well. Across Sweeten Creek Road, in that institutional zoning, there are residential apartments as well as a nursing home and rehabilitation facility. And then Hendersonville Road has uh, a storage use most, most close to the site. The proposal that you have this evening is to construct that multifamily apartment complex. As you can see on the site map, there's a total of 192 units, a mix of one, two, and three bedroom configurations in these eight residential buildings. The maximum height of the buildings is 36 feet, so it's about three stories, and then that single story clubhouse that was mentioned. Also um, scattered throughout the site, there are three one-story garage structures. This is very similar in the layout that uh, most of you saw just a few months ago. That was the Palisades development that was up on Mills Gap Road uh, by the same developer, which is currently under construction. Access is from two driveways, as you can see, both from Sweeten Creek Road, and parking is scattered throughout the sites uh, and also includes a small pervious paving lot. Uh, pedestrian pathways throughout the site internally. There's no sidewalk shown on the plans right now and that's because the NCDOT is, will be widening Sweeten Creek Road in the near future. Um, so we didn't want to have the developer go ahead and put that in now even though Sweeten Creek, Sweeten Creek is a needed linkage. The DOT will be constructing that sidewalk as a part of their road widening process and, and there's a, a fee in lieu where the developer will pay a portion of that cost. There's landscaping and open space as required by the code and shown on plans. Uh, uh, some existing vegetation will be preserved, most of that landscaping and open spaces around the perimeter of the site. The project was approved with conditions by the TRC in October and approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission in November. No public comment uh, has been received other than one uh, speaker at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting who spoke in, in general favor of, of the project. So the requested rezoning um, is really the, the uh, heart of the staff report. It is, as noted, not consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. Uh, we have a number of policies throughout the plan that state that industrial, industrially zoned areas should be preserved for suitable industrial uses. However, as was noted, there are a number of precedents throughout the last 10 years or so, um, a couple of them or a number of them were noted in the staff report, where council has approved similar rezonings, down zoning industrial uh, and commercial industrial areas to residential. <coughs> so, uh, so staff also consulted with the economic development committee on this particular proposal, they agreed that the comprehensive plan does have that statement that industrially zoned areas should be preserved for industrial uses, uh, but in this instance they didn't feel strong enough to oppose this uh, development. So staff also evaluated the requests based on the uses that are nearby. Uh, as you saw in the packet, this is Exhibit C map shows uh, some of the nearby zoning and, and uses. The site in question is right here, industrially zoned with the red box around it, just to, to point that out to you, with the CI and industrial to the north and south. Um, the yellow is are parcels that are within residential use. It's a, there are, there's a high predominance of, in, of residentially used properties in the area. Um, just here to the west, it's blank because that is county zoning. That county zoning district that's in place there does allow both industrial and residential uh, together in that, in that area. Uh, so with doing this analysis, looking at the uses and the zoning that's in the vicinity, staff felt that 
you know, it was such a mix of uses um, that it was hard to determine whether or not it was compatible, this, this proposal was compatible with the, with the neighborhood, with the vicinity. It's just not a, there's just not a strong character. It's not strongly industrial or commercial industrial, but it's also, you know, um, there's that residential use with some spatterings of, of other non-residential areas. So the context was just difficult to, to define is, is basically what I'm trying to get at. Uh, so staff felt that we didn't make a strong recommendation either way. We felt that based on the comprehensive plan policies regarding industrially zoned land and the need to preserve them, you, we felt that council could say that that was the priority. We felt that based on the context with the predominance of residential uses, uh, you could also say that that uh, takes priority and that the area is changing in nature and residential would be appropriate. Uh, so, so staff kind of left you at that, that tipping point right there. Uh, so that concludes my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I believe the developers here would like to make a presentation and is asked to be able to have 15 minutes to do that and that's fine. First, we have a question. Aren't we supposed to be sworn in? Well, not this. No, no. this is a conditional use permit. Good question, okay. but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Just uh, okay. My name is uh, William Ratchford. I represent uh, Triangle Real Estate and Southwood Realty on this project. Uh, Triangle Real Estate uh, and Southwood Realty, both fam uh, family-owned companies, uh, started. And Triangle was first started in 1965. Uh, currently, uh, currently it's ran by, ran by my father, my uncle, started by my grandfather. Uh, it's a regional company located in Gastonia, North Carolina. Uh, we have currently the Palisades under construction in, in Asheville, and we have a project, one, a project in Hendersonville completed and a project uh, under construction as well. Uh, we 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 have uh, 71 communities uh, with three under with three additionals under construction and three under planning. Uh, this uh, this project uh, we saw we saw a need first with the Palisades, but you have a huge need for apartments in the city of Asheville. Uh, I I personally set rents for the company of. Uh, we, of the 14,900 units, I set uh, 13,000 of the units rents uh, in different markets. We've looked at every major sub-market in, uh, in North Carolina and uh, the, garden, uh, the garden rate apartments, you know, except for a small contingent of South Park and Charlotte and a small contingent of Enfield and Raleigh-Durham, you have the highest rate of apartments. Uh, just because you have a huge lack of supply. Uh, there's, there's not even a close price on us. Uh, you're having some apartments hit $1,600 on three bedrooms in this market, which is uh, in suburban, and that's unobtainable in any other market. Uh, we feel that our apartment rates that we have shown are not listed in your affordable category, but because of our placement of apartments and because we're both the builders, owners, designers, and uh, long-term holders of these projects, uh, we can get a project to prove, we can get a project in quickly that could reduce the rates uh, of the apartments in this area. Uh, it's figured that we had figured our rents with the Palisades figuring this project and the uh, Avalon project by uh, Flournoy coming in. Uh, we've, we've gotten market surveys from, Cap, from Capstones, uh, a third party broker, thinking that rents are going to go up three and a half to four percent in this market next year. Uh, that does not include the Palisades project coming in, but that was, uh, and that does not include this project coming in. But it, it does include four noise, and it does include our uh, project in Hendersonville. Uh, so it's you've you've hit rates that are, you've hit rates 
you've hit rates so we're concerned that you know we think we can come in and be a good player and uh, improve the affordability in this market and it will either lead to better housing for your uh, for your uh, constituents uh, and it will also allow for uh, positive growth in the uh, positive growth and uh, cheaper housing to allow job, better job creation from future suppliers uh, of sub future suppliers of industry and commercial wanting to come in. Uh, this is about a twenty million dollar project that we would uh, would have uh, four t four full time uh, personnel, two part time. And then major contractors of landscapers, painters, you know, of eight to ten major companies that will uh, be predominantly used every week. Uh, we're long-term holders of properties. We're not built as merchant builders, so we take the time to uh, to see, you know, if something if we know something won't last for five after five or ten years, and you have to repair it, we try to go ahead and put in the extra effort. Because if not, I'm going to have to come back and fix it in 15 years. So we've uh, we've worked on our decks and used uh, used uh, hardier materials. We're using uh, Trex board, for example, uh, which is supposed to last up to 50 years. Uh, at this time, I'm going to pass to uh, our engineer to explain more about the site itself. Good evening, my name is Tom Jones. I'm with Lapsley and Associates. We're the civil engineers and the land planners, and we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all about this project. I think William's done a good job talking about the rates. What I want to talk about just a little bit was the specifically the rezoning. I think there may be some concern about that, and I just wanted to touch on that. The one factor to consider for the rezoning, to me, would be the compatibility with the adjacent and neighboring properties, and, and pretty much compatibility with the neighborhood. I, I created a little map I don't know if it's in your package, but the map here, the orange areas are residential uses nearby, uh, not, not related to zoning or anything, just where the actual residential uses are. Carrington Place is immediately across the street, um, and, but you have residential uses all on the east side of Sweet and Creek Road as you go north. Um, also, uh, two parcels uh, to the north from this project, we have uh, apartments and there's a church and then additional res residential uses to the north. <laughs> if we drill down into the, a little closer into the actual uses, I've labeled the uses to the north and south small commercial. I think Jessica might refer to it as industrial and I'm going to show kind of what those uses really, what they're like right now. This is just an aerial image of the site. Uh, if we start on the north side, we have a part supplier, there's actually a small church, we have some offices, a uh, print shop, a limousine service, and other offices. That's the nature of the development to the north. And to the south, we have, there's metal roofing, a couple vacant buildings, and then a, a web hosting type um, office type use. So I just want to, I guess, make sure it's fairly clear that it's, it's not heavy industrial uses to the north or south, and there's a lot of residential uses basically all around, especially on the east side of Sweet and Creek Road. The other, I think, factor to consider for the rezoning would be specifically the rezoning of industrial use or industrial land to non-industrial. I think that may be a concern that some council members may have. Um, I think the 2025 Economic Development Plan is concerned about the loss of land suitable for industrial use. And I did want to touch on the suitability of this property for industrial use. It also, but specifically there too, the economic development plan is worried about um, loss of industrial land specifically to uses such as retail and low density residential. But you know, here we have an infill type development and it's high density. So I think, I think that should alleviate some of that concern. But the main thing I want to touch on will be the suitability of the property. Here's a map of the current zoning situation where the purple, which is the project, and one sm smaller parcel to the south, 
is the, the true industrial zoning, which will not allow apartments. Green is pretty much everything else. And I believe all those other ones would, would allow apartments. They're commercial industrial and like the CI zoning and other types of zoning. So basically what this amounts to for um, the triangle guys amounts to like a spot zoning of industrial. Yes, there are industrial um, opportunities around that, but this is one specific property where apartments are not allowed by the zoning. Our company works on a lot of different industrial projects and we're familiar with a lot of them and, and you all are too. And I wanted to list just a few that we've, we're familiar with. We've worked on the Sierra Nevada site, which is about a 30 acre tract. The FedEx Distribution Center we have 13 acres. A Pepsi Distribution Center of 20 acres. Empire Distributors of 25 acres. And there's some closer here in Asheville that you all are familiar with, such as New Belgium, which we haven't worked on, but it's about 19 acres, and Lenamar, which is 65 acres. The property that we, that we have to develop here is about 13 acres, but there's a railroad right away which cuts off a lot of the usable land in terms of being able to put buildings. Um, that really brings the usable acres down to about 10 acres. And a note I put on the bottom here is that projects of less than 13 acres can be found for industrial um, projects, but they're typically part of a larger industrial park, such as Sweeten Creek Industrial Park, which is on up the road. You rarely, we rarely work on an industrial project of this size of property that's off by itself somewhere. The, the next thing I want to talk about is just specifically the suitability of the site for industry. Um, I've already pointed out that it, it's infill, which I think is a positive. But the total area of 12.3 acres, I've already touched on 10 acres are outside the railroad right away. So we've already limited in our size there. The site has an elevation difference of 58 feet from the highest point on Sweet Creek Road to lowest point at the corner of the property near the railroad. So it's, it's a large difference in elevation from Sweet Creek to the railroad, which makes it very difficult to develop a large industrial site. In order to create a relatively flat pad, which if you're going to create a large industry, they would typically require a large building and a lot of associated parking. If you're going to create a relatively flat pad for that large building, you'd have to create a wall about 34 feet high all around the, the back and bring in about 150,000 cubic yards, which is a lot, a lot of dump trucks um, of fill material to make that a flat site. If you were to do that, you'd be way up above the railroad. So there's just so many things that don't make sense in terms of this site being a productive site for a large industry. And, and, the, and when I say large industry, I, you know, I think we're thinking job creators or those a lot of jobs. Um, we had, I think, at Planning and Zoning, a gentleman asked me if we could, if the site could be developed something like the adjacent property with smaller buildings to take advantage of that topography. And I said, yes, so it could be developed that way but then you don't capture that large industry. You don't get a, a large manufacturer to come in with a, a little 2,000 square foot building and, and a 10 parking spaces. So that was kind of the, the conclusion I wanted to, to offer was that based on the surrounding zoning and property uses, the size and nature of the property and the fact that the property, this is something we haven't touched on yet, the property in its current state, which looks like this, it's been like this for about over 10 years and for sale for more than that. I think for maybe 12 years it's been for sale. And we feel like if, if it was a good site for industry in that amount of time, an industry would have likely come in and actually developed this site. Um, so, so based on all these things, including that the property had been available for over 10 years, we feel like an apartment project is an excellent use of the property at this time. And we want to open ourselves up for questions you all might have. And we would also request the opportunity, if we can't answer those questions tonight, to continue it to a, a meeting in the future. No, we can have discussion. Part of Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Wait, where? Okay. Let's see. 
Is there anyone else that would like to speak on the developer's behalf? If you'd just state your name for the record. Gene Ratchford, Jr. Uh, just the only thing is I was do a clarification. We'd like to address any of the council's questions at this time, but uh, I think uh, the council may have be uh, more comfortable with the continuation until uh, February, the meeting in February, uh, due to your land use issues that you are discussing amongst yourself at this time. And uh, okay. we're, we're very, that's what we would like. But any questions that you have, as far as this time, this time we'd be glad to address. Okay, let's see, Maggie. That's about the buzz. The timer is about to buzz. Um, <laughs> okay. Let does any would anyone like to make a question comment, uh, Mark? If you would go ahead. Um, Mayor Manhammer, thank you. <laughs> I got to use that as well. Um, I uh, I was able to spend a few minutes uh, with the developer and staff before the meetings began this afternoon. Um, I'm prepared to support continuation of this public hearing to the uh, February 12th meeting. Um, and a little bit of, uh, more, uh, I appreciate Mr. Jones addressing the land use uh, aspects, especially the industrial site loss aspects. Um, that uh, is not normally what a developer would do, but I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I, I want to make sure the community understands the the struggle at least I've, I have internally in, in terms of sorting this out. Uh, this is one of the relatively few industrial uh, sites zoned so in the city. Um, our 2025 comprehensive land use plan was adopted 10 years ago in 2003. There are several places in the economic development section of that plan that highlight the lack of industrial sites in our city. And I'd like to quote just a little bit. Um, Lockwood Green Consulting, the firm that helped us with the plan, analyzed the local industrial site situation and made the following key findings. Asheville and Buncombe County have the smallest total inventory and most limited mix of developed industrial sites and parks of all metropolitan areas that the firm has examined in recent years. Um, the, uh, it, it goes on to say that it recommends that additional land should be acquired by local government or the private sector to support future development needs. So loss of industrial sites was identified by a broad section of community leaders, including real estate developers and business leaders uh, and civic leaders to guide us in this direction. I agree that um, with staff, staff highlights for us how over the past 10 years, we, the city council has voted to convert industrial zone properties to other uses. And so despite the admonitions of, of people at the time of the development of the plan, we've, we've backslid even more. And so I think if a consultant were to look at it again today, they would express that the need is even worse. Uh, for me, Mayor, um, I am eager to learn more about uh, this challenge we face as a community to maintain industrial sites in the interest of job growth, good paying job growth in the future. I think the input of Mr. Jones is helpful for us to learn about that. Uh, in discussion of a continuance to February 12th, um, staff has described that they think that we can, staff can help us organize data and input so that council could be much better informed on that question of industrial site loss. Uh, so my motion, Madam Mayor, would be to uh, continue this public hearing until February 12th. Uh, I would suggest that we ask for any public in additional public input this, this evening to become better informed before uh, we would go on to the next item, however. Just uh, second. Okay. <laughs> You read my mind. Um, all right, and if there are, um, we're going to open it up for a public hearing because we have a motion. So we'll hear if there's anyone in the community that wants to make a comment. Um, but I would also invite members of council. You know, the developers offered asked for some feedback uh, on this proposal, and if there's any at this time, this would be the time to say it. Uh, one question I'd like to have answered between now and when we, assuming we we postpone the vote on it. Uh, in light of the idea of pre preserving industrial 
uh, zoning uh, options or in industrial properties. I, I wonder if the access to the railroad has any particular uh, benefit for a potential industry, industrial use there. Um, not every property has railroad access and uh, it appears that railroad transport of goods is increasing in America um, because it's so much cheaper than trucking. And I'm wondering if, I don't know, that this, I'm, I'm, it's sort of an open question. And I don't know that anybody here has an answer for that right now, but I'd, I'd like to know about that. Is, is there anyone else on, I think if we could just kind of get through the various points and then maybe if you want to address some of them, that would be good. But how about we, um, are there any other concerns or questions, comments? Yep. I'd just like to make a comment because that uh, actually that 2025 plan that Mark uh, voted from, I, my name's the first in the book of, of the, the actual book was done at a time when I was chairing planning and zoning. So we felt like at that time uh, that, that we needed to, to reserve industrial space. It, was, it seemed very important. That's what the consultant had said. There was, uh, as Mark clearly pointed out, that there's a minimum of it in the city of Asheville. And um, I was also part of the council subsequently that uh, that uh, elected to uh, change that zoning and a lot of those, uh, or a number of those uh, properties that were zoned industrial. And the reason for it, quite frankly, was that uh, we were not getting a lot of, uh, a lot of interest in our industrially zoned property. There was uh, uh, difficulties from several standpoints. One that uh, uh, Housing is also in short supply in Asheville, and we, we've all clearly recognized that apartments are very much in, in need here, and um, largely where we have, uh, we, we did one large zoning that was uh, single family, but the bulk of them have been either for uh, multifamily or for commercial or some sort of zoning mixed use rather than purely uh, industrial. So. I understand the interest now in doing this. And I also understand the interest in, in perhaps waiting until February where we might be able to talk to uh, folks in the Economic Development Coalition and see if there's a market out there. On the other hand, we do have a need for housing and the apartment housing does resonate well but that that's an important part and we have a fair amount of commercial activity or industrial activity occurring uh, just outside our city limits. That, that those people have to have a place to live or we actually end up creating more sprawl as people go the other direction. So we have an opportunity here to improve our tax base, improve uh, the amount of, uh, of living space and uh, provide people jobs or places to live near where they work in that area. So I want us to be careful with what we're doing. Is not a lot of times we don't have the opportunity for someone to come in and do something like this. And I have a concern that property sat there for 10 years, and I don't know if these folks have owned the property now, or they're waiting for the zoning for it to be conveyed, or what. So I'm sure time probably matters. Time is money in these instances. So. I would urge us to think very carefully. Uh, we, we've identified something here that's in a plan that was written 10 years ago that has largely been changed by this council over a period of time to accommodate <laughs> living space and to add to our tax and to our, our tax base and to provide people a convenient place to be near where they're working in the, the industrial complexes we have nearby today. So, uh, I don't know where they stand on it, where they own it, what's going to happen to it if we don't allow it. They, they're not industrial builders, so what are they going to do with this property? So that, that has to come into it. Okay, I hope you're jotting these down. Um, all right, next. The loss of the industrial land is something that I'm real keen about as far as learning more. I appreciate your comments, Vice Mayor, around uh, really having a close look at the industrial industrially zoned stock that we have and running that in a, in a more deliberate process through the EDC and let's identify those parcels that we think are ripe for this type of rezoning. I, I, I think that there, there may be plenty of them that are, 
but I don't know uh, which are and which aren't. I went to the site and um, you can put soccer fields on that thing, it's so flat. Um, it's, it, it looks to me like a very usable site and when I, when I see industry, you know, we have New Belgium siting down by the river but they're also seeking a distribution location and I look at that site and I think, wow, this, this could be a fantastic distribution location for somebody. I think there are probably a lot of different uses there that, um, could, that, that could move in there. Uh, I think that looking back over the last 10 years, we had industry fleeing the United States in general, not just around here. We've just come out of a great recession. We're just seeing industry beginning to relocate here. I think that there may be opportunities that will emerge uh, in the next several years. And once we rezone this, it's gone forever. We lose it forever. Uh, and those opportunities go away with it. If, if we are going to look at rezoning industrial space, I think we have to do that with our strategic goals in mind as well, with the recognition that we are trying to incent affordable housing. We've had hundreds and hundreds of apartment units come before this council over the last few months and, that have been approved. And exactly 14 of them are designated affordable. Um, yes, we need to improve housing stock, uh, but it looks as though we're just going to create one kind. And that's something I think we need to look closely at as well. The uh, open space requirements around this site as well are, are troubling for me in that they're only going to be using the existing buffer and not actually providing any open space. It's all concrete. Once you drive in, unless you want to hang out in some scrubby pines on the edge of someone else's property. Um, so that's, that's another concern as far as actually making a place that can be a neighborhood. Um, if you're going to have 192 folks live in there, it ought to be able to become a neighborhood and have, that, have a community uh, build itself around it. So I have those concerns as secondary ones to the analysis of uh, just kind of the policy implications for transforming the industrial to residential. Anyone else have a question, comment? Okay, would you like to address any of those? I mean, you, you can at this time. I believe the first question was the railroad. I, I was suspect that one reason this property is zoned industrial is because there is a railroad beside it and that, that does make sense. I do think though from other projects we've worked on associated with industrial projects with the railroad, the topography, I go back to that, I know we just talked to, touched on that there are some flat uh, areas out there, maybe where soccer could be played, but the, the reality is there's a couple flat pads that's been graded in the past. There's a couple small flat pads graded in the front of the property, which you can actually see, and if I can find my little laser pointer, I'll point them out. Two relatively small areas where I think the a prior uh, speculative thing was to have a couple uh, commercial buildings of some variety in the front, and then this is graded to a lower level than these two, and, I, and the railroad down here is much lower than all of these. This, is, I believe, is this area down here is about 14 feet lower than this area. I believe I, it was 58 feet from here all the way down to here. So it really is, it would be a real challenge if impractical, if not impossible, to get, to offload something from the railroad way down here and get it up to, to basically street level. That would be, I think, the uh, concern I'd have if you were really trying to make this into an industrial site. Regarding the ownership of the property, Triangle did buy the property uh, about a year ago, I believe, and they can correct me if I'm wrong on that. So they own the property. I think they were likely figuring that they could be rezoned or it would accommodate apartments when they bought it. I know they, they're not, I think like Mr. Davis said, they're not um, industrial de um, developers. They, they do apartments, that's what they know. So I know they would, they would have bought it thinking that that was going to work out. And the, um, I believe that's the only the, uh, questions that we can answer at this time. We, we do have the green space issue. Well, there, there is very little vegetation around it to preserve on the site. You know, it, like I was talking about a minute ago, it is previously graded. I think a question was, has been asked about a garden space, and the developer does intend to make a garden space, and right now we plan on showing that here, in the, and it's really near the front. Uh, but it might possibly end up in the, in the railroad right away if that could be worked out with the railroad. So there is an opportunity for uh, the garden space, there's the community um, clubhouse, which will have a pool 
Uh, there, and another green feature we, that I think Jessica pointed on was they do plan to put some pervious pavement in. So, and it, the amount of green spaces do meet or exceed all the required seed requirements. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second to continue this uh, matter until February 12th, um, 2014. If there's anyone wishing to, oh, can I ask just one question? Yeah. So, can you clarify what what are we going to do between now and February? Uh, I mean, that's a good question. I I think what I heard was a request for staff to review with us our current industrially zoned properties. And that's exactly right, uh, Madam Mayor and uh, Assistant manager Kathy Ball might want to help us understand more about that. Yes, um, I think we have provided the the amount of um, acres that the city had in the city that are zoned industrial and the number of parcels. I think what um, what the, we would do over the next couple of months is to go back and look at the suitability of those properties and even prioritize them to say which ones would be appropriate to um, to, to maintain in that category which other ones are not as likely to be usable space so that it gives us some perspective of the total picture. So that's our plan at this point. Um, we have been, I've been keeping notes so that we can also provide additional information that you've requested, which of them are near railroads, what is the slope of those properties that would cause the development of them to be very expensive. So I think that's the analysis that we would be doing to bring back to you before then. Okay. Um, will it go back to EDC or planning PED? Yeah, the, the EDC point I think is a good one as well. And, and uh, Councilman Davis pointed out that I, I think he hoped the EDC would focus on this a little bit. I'm, I'm the council's representative and board member on the Economic Development Coalition. We had a meeting last Friday morning. Um, staff points out that there was some dialogue between our staff and EDC staff on this point. Uh, my, my take in talking with staff last Friday is that they weren't quite sure exactly what their role was, um, didn't know exactly how to engage in what they perceived as a little more of a political process. And I would like to, uh, uh, Kathy, make sure we include uh, some sort of uh, dialogue, uh, design dialogue with not just staff but board members at the EDC. I know the EDC uh, put energy about six months ago into a very comprehensive assessment of industrial sites countywide, and I think they may have some data that will help us, um, you know, with our project. Okay. Mayor, Matt, were you going to open the public hearing? Mm -hmm. okay. um, so at, at this time, I'll open the public hearing. Anyone uh, wishing to make a comment on this item may feel free to do so and note that there is a motion pending to continue this matter to February 12th. Okay, no one wishing to make a comment. I will close the public hearing. All right, any other questions or comments before we vote on the motion to continue? No, okay. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much for coming and making the presentation and we will do our work in the meantime. The next is a public hearing to consider conditional zoning of 2.12 acres located on Taft Avenue from RS4 residential single family medium density district to RS8 residential single family high density district slash conditional zoning to facilitate the development of a single family residential community composed of 10 lots and 10 detached single family dwellings. Ms. Cogger. Mayor Manheimer, members of council, um, this is a conditional zoning re request for, for 3.34 acres of property, currently three different lots as you can see here, located off of Taft Avenue in the Shiloh community. Uh, here is Taft Avenue, Hendersonville Road is somewhere over here, this is the South Forest Shopping Center where there's the Ingalls, it's there. The property as you indicated is currently zoned RS4 and is traversed by a stream and a sewer line down through this path here. There is a 30-foot platted right-of-way that you can see that runs through the middle of the properties there and abuts all of the, the three properties in question. Orient this 
same way you were looking at the, um, the area map. Asheville Area Habitat for Humanity um, is presenting to you um, a proposal to create a 10-lot subdivision utilizing the existing right-of-way to create a new street, um, which would be named McKinley Avenue, that would provide access to the 10 lots. There would be a turnaround, as you see here, for emergency um, vehicle purposes. Um, the street that they're proposing, McKinley Avenue, will meet all city standards in terms of pavement width, um, would all be 24 feet, but a modification to the right-of-way width would be required due to constraints at the entrance to the development. If you went out there, you can see um, there are two homes that sit pretty, quick, uh, pretty close to the area uh, where this right-of-way sits. Um, so in, through this portion of the property, there would be a 30-foot right-of-way. It would increase to 35 feet and then to 40 feet um, as the uh, control of the property increased for, uh, for um, the folks at Habitat. Um, so they are requesting modification uh, for the, not the pavement width, but the right-of-way width, and that's acceptable to our, our traffic engineering folks. They are requesting a rezoning to RS8CZ because of the property constraints. Um, what I indicated before, the sewer line, and you can see them here, the sewer line and the stream there basically create a very difficult situation here in terms of developing that property. And also the desire to create as many affordable units as is possible um, in this particular development. While the rezoning would allow smaller lots than would be found in RS4, the density, the resulting density, would actually be less than what could be on that property if you took the whole 3.34 acres and looked at it in terms of RS4, you could do 14 units. But again, because of the constraints, um, they're doing 10 units, so the density is not any greater than what would be allowed if you, if you could develop the entire property. And the lot size, while it is smaller than what would be allowed in RS4, is not out of uh, keeping with the other lot sizes that are found in the immediate area. It's very much in keeping, as a matter of fact. In an effort to provide, there's one other modification that's needed, and that's in an effort to provide an adjoining property owner with some parking relief. Again, if you went out there, and you can actually even see it on this map, this is a very small lot um, with the house very uh, c covering most of the lot uh, square footage. And so basically the people that have lived there in the past and um, is true currently have used this right of way for parking purposes. In an effort to help um, alleviate that situation, what uh, the developer is proposing is, is pulling back on this lot a little bit to create a driveway here. So one of the things they're requesting and able to uh, be able to afford that to, to that particular property owner and assist in that particular issue is they are requesting a modification of 382 square feet to um, lot number one in the development. All the other lots are conforming. So lot number one would be 382 square, square feet smaller than would typically um, be required resulting in a 4,618 square foot lot. And actually a, a lot of the lots right in that particular area are even smaller than that, particularly the one in question that they're trying to, to assist. The remainder of the area, as you can see um, highlighted in green there, would be tree safe and open space area. Uh, they did conduct a meeting with the neighborhood at the Linwood Crump Center. Uh, the major issue was some concern about traffic, but um, I feel like the, most of the folks in the area came away um, supportive of this project um, and, and not as concerned as when, when they walked in the door. Um, I've heard nothing since that time. Um, there was one gentleman, the gentleman that lives right here, who came to the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. He was concerned about uh, being aware, being notified when the uh, construction of the roadway was going to begin. Um, there was a good dialogue between the folks at Habitat and this particular gentleman and his son and um, uh, information exchange about contact and I, I feel like that was resolved positively. The project was reviewed by TRC on October 21st, approved with conditions, um, and Planning and Zoning Commission uh, at their meeting on November 6th voted unanimously uh, to recommend this to you. Um, that completes my presentation. Thank you. Do we have a representative from the developer wishing to speak on this? Please just state your name. Sure. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. I'm Will Bowie with Lapsley & Associates Engineering. This is Paul Reeves from Habitat for Humanity. 
And uh, we don't have much to add to Mrs. Fields' presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have about the project. We feel like this is a good project for the neighborhood, a good infill project, and it's certainly providing a need that the city has. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for the developer? No? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions, comment, discussion? Yes. Uh, I was just going to make a motion. Make a motion. Yes. I move to approve the zoning map amendment from RS4 to RS8 CZ with a lot size modification for lot number one of 382 square feet and a right of way modification ranging from 10 to 20 feet in size and subject to the conditions <coughs> recommended by staff and all standard conditions. I find that this request is reasonable and is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted plans based on information provided in the staff report and as stated in the staff recommendation. Second. All right. Um, Martha, do I need to cl clearly state we're opening it for a public hearing when I do that or just ask anyone to come forward? Is that suitable? You need to clearly open it up for a public hearing. Okay. Yes. All right. So since I didn't say that exactly, I'm learning this, um, we will open it up for public comment. Is there anyone wishing to offer a comment on this project? As expected, there is not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have a motion before us. Any other questions or comments before we vote? Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The motion passes. Thank you. That concludes the public hearings for tonight. We have um, two items of new business. The first is a resolution accepting the repetitive loss area analysis report as a companion document to the Buncombe County All Hazards Mitigation Plan. Shannon Tug. I like that you guys are matching. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Mannheimer, Council Members, and members of the public. I'll only take a minute to introduce this next item. We are asking for your support to adopt a resolution accepting the repetitive loss analysis prepared by Brown and Caldwell. The reason we've requested this analysis is, or commissioned this analysis, is that because for the last six months, the staff in the Development Services Department have been collaborating with our colleagues in Public Works on a very large and detailed application that we commonly refer to as the CRS application. Um, this application, if we are successful and are admitted into the CRS program, will effectively lower premium uh, or the insurance rates for those individuals who play, pay flood insurance. As my staff report indicated, the repetitive loss analysis is a mandatory piece of the CRS application without which we would not be eligible. The application also includes a significant public education piece, so your approval has to come after a brief public presentation on the analysis. So we appreciate your willingness to consider the presentation first before voting on the resolution. We look forward to bringing these cost savings to our citizens. Um, so without any more delay, I'm going to turn it over to Hal Clarkson from Brown and Caldwell, who's one of the consultants who worked on the, on the analysis, and he will walk you through the presentation. Thank you. Madam Mayor, uh, members of council, thank you very much. This is a very brief uh, presentation, but if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer what I can. And if I can't answer it tonight, I'll be sure to get back to you. But um, uh, as Shannon said, you're, you're, the city is seeking to uh, join the community rating system. It's administered by ISO, the insurance <laughs> services offices, uh, very similar to the programs that they run for fire departments where they provide them with a, a, a rating of how well they perform, except this one is for your floodplain management program. Uh, the city currently has about a sufficient number of points to come in at a class eight uh, rating, which would offer a 10% discount on flood insurance premiums uh, every year for your residents. You have, uh, I think currently, according to the federal insurance agency, your residents are paying about uh, $750,000 a year in insurance premiums. The repetitive loss area analysis requires that the city um, look at all of those structures that have had um, that have filed claims against their flood insurance uh, over the last two or more claims over the last 10 years. Uh, that's considered a repetitive loss uh, structure. The repetitive loss area looks at those structures plus any buildings that are nearby that are subject to the same uh, flooding conditions. They don't have to have filed a claim 
but if they're subject to the same type of flooding then they're included in the analysis area there's a five step planning process that the city uh, is going through to uh, comply with the CRS program uh, property owners will be notified uh, of the findings of the study uh, other agencies organizations were contacted to see what information they had for instance we know that the uh, Corps of Engineers has performed some analysis for you in these areas uh, site visits were conducted for each of the buildings that were identified in the repetitive loss areas. Uh, we looked at mitigation measures. What, what types of efforts could we undergo to reduce flood damages against these structures that are in the repetitive loss areas? And then finally, a report has been generated uh, that we're seeking a resolution on tonight. FEMA supplied us with a list of about 18 repetitive loss properties. Those are spread across six areas uh, within the city. We generated maps for each of those areas and included the additional structures that are subject to similar flooding characteristics. That came out to be about 90 different structures in those six different areas. And we uh, generated fact sheets for each one. And the fact sheets contain basic information about the structure itself and then also uh, suggestions for mitigation measures. We made three basic uh, recommendations for each structure. And keep in mind that these recommendations are purely voluntary. They'll go back to the structure owner and say, these are some things that you could do uh, to protect yourself. Now, the three basic recommendations were either wet flood proofing, which allows flood waters to move in and out of the building, uh, but you elevate uh, items inside the building to, to minimize damage. You can dry flood proof, which essentially tries to keep the flood waters out of the building, a good thing. Um, or compliance or removal of the structure. There were a number of structures that due to their age and structural integrity uh, would not be suitable for either wet uh, or dry flood proofing. So general uh, action items were recommended to the city per the, the CRS program and those were to continue the public outreach contacting these uh, owners of these structures, provide them with technical assistance on how they can protect themselves, uh, fully enforce the building codes in regards to the structures that are um, beginning to show some age and wear and are no longer um, structurally sound for, for flood proofing and then uh, Increasing the awareness or flood warning systems, if possible, in these areas. A lot of uh, dry and, and wet flood proofing techniques require manual operation of a system just prior to the, to the flood. You've got to put gates in front of doors or, or uh, lock down hatches and that sort of thing. And so uh, an early warning system will let folks know a flood is on the way is, is imperative to uh, making this operate correctly. Finally, moving forward, uh, some basic steps that the city will have to do, and that's um, continue to advise and educate those uh, repetitive loss structure owners about uh, their particular condition in ways they can protect themselves. Track the progress on, on this particular plan, how many buildings have been mitigated and to what extent, and then report those results annually back to the community rating system, and then every five years go back through this process and relook at those structures to see, see where you stand what actions have been uh, taken, which ones were effective, which ones were not. And with that, I'll answer any questions that I can. All right, any questions? Of those structures, um, how many of them are derelict buildings that really just need to come down? We looked at 90 different buildings, and there were about uh, 18 to 20 uh, that we thought would not be suitable for either wet or dry flood proofing. So, would it be up to us as the city to go see those people now and talk to them about their future plans? Or? Yeah, yes, sir. That, that is part of the plan that each of the building owners would be contacted and, and their options um, provided to them and, and assistance provided as to what they might be able to do. Yes, sir. Uh, this, is, uh, this may be beyond the scope of what you guys have investigated, but you might have some sense of it. Um, the, the, Every time there is a, a big flood, or, or even a, mo a modest flood, I hear people say, well, that has to have been a 100-year flood. <laughs> and when, uh, in 2006, when the two hurricanes came through, right. uh, that seemed like a big one. And I, I look back, and actually, it, it wasn't that unusual in the 100-year context. Can you, is, is there anything that you guys looked at in terms of pr predicted frequency of floods? Y you used the 10-year rolling time window, but Right. Is there anything you can tell us about how likely floods are to come on what frequency? Right. 
The, um, the, the hundred year flood that is the common reference point for the flood insurance program actually has about a 1% chance in any given year of happening. It can happen five times in any one year or never in your lifetime. I think some of the, um, uh, the uh, statistics that FEMA quote is, quotes is that over a 30 year mortgage, uh, you've got about a 30% chance of that, that flood occurring. Um, you know, a smaller flood can be just as damaging. I mean, a 1% or a 100 year flood is, is a very specific rainfall event with a very specific flooding characteristic. Um, but the rivers don't know what lines are drawn on the maps. And so you can receive, a, you know, something that's a 99 year flood or a 98 year flood, something that's of a different percentage that can still cause some significant damage. You could have clogging and bridges and culverts that cause water surfaces to be much higher than you would normally see. So um, I would say in, in this, this particular area of the buildings that we looked at, if they are repetitive loss structures, they, they've seen it more than once and chances are they're going to see flooding again before the life of the building ends. Right. And if an individual uh, property owner chooses not to do anything, um, does that affect the other property owners or? Um, n not necessarily, uh, not directly, maybe indirectly, just if uh, folks know that there's a building that's continually flooding, uh, you know, it may impact um, property values. And, and I will say this about uh, this particular report, uh, that we're very sensitive to the flood insurance information. It is subject to the Privacy Act, and so we can't release information on specific structures. That's one of the reason for ha reasons for having a larger repetitive loss area, including multiple buildings. But uh, hope that answered your question. Yeah, I'm curious. I didn't quite follow the numbers. If if we participate in this and get accepted to the program, does that save uh, insurance costs for just the property owners in the flood area, or for the entire city? Anyone that's paying a flood insurance premium will see a decrease in their flood insurance premiums. So you don't have to be in the at-risk areas. To, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And in fact, um, you know, community or uh, residents can purchase flood insurance whether they're in the, uh, a flood zone or not. Even if they're in the uh, outside of a flood zone, they can purchase flood insurance, and they would still see uh, a decrease in that premium cost. Any other questions? And we need a motion to adopt this? Is, is, yes, ma'am. Okay. I'll, I'll make the motion to adopt it. All right. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there anyone wishing to make a comment regarding the motion pending? No? All right. Any other questions or comments? Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Um, all right. I have. Um, uh, item B of new business motion dissolving the rules committee retreat committee and the personnel committee which are to be encompassed in the functions of a new city council committee um, there is a revised memo at your chair with the subject line proposed committee uh, and the idea behind this committee which is poorly named and Sub open to suggestions for new names um, called the governance committee is to roll together some of these other committees that don't meet very often um, but to also um, capture some areas that we previously have not handled by committee and have been uh, a little bit disjointed in in an effort to make them more more um, cohesive and they are listed below, which is to um, include uh, the development of our legislative agenda. Um, to in addition to in addition to the items I already mentioned, rules, personnel, and retreat. Um, to follow through on the strategic planning um, goals that we come up with at our city council retreat. To have some follow through and accountability. Uh, on our goals and tracking them and measuring them and reporting them uh, and also to enhance our public engagement and development um, with recommendations for best practices so the idea there is that we do have um, a communications 
department, but the, there's an opportunity to enhance that department and facilitate greater public engagement um, and to bring back to this council some recommendations for how to structure that. Um, that, that is the concept and uh, I, um, I uh, have had an opportunity to talk to each of you about this uh, new committee, this governance committee, and I think hopefully got it wordsmithed correctly. Um, and the um, members of the committee will be myself, uh, the vice mayor, and Gordon Smith, Councilman Gordon Smith. Um, this, the adoption of this, including the membership of the committee, will require a motion which will consolidate the existing subcommittees and then create this new committee. I make a motion to establish a governance committee and dissolve, dissolving the personnel committee, the retreat committee, and the rules committee. Second. All right. Um, any other questions or comments from council? No. Uh, the only thing that I would just have for or ask for the record is that we just relook at this committee oh, yes. and I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, absolutely. We, we talked about cre creating the committee and then revisiting the functions of the committee, see if it's working well uh, in another six months or so. I'll consider that a friendly amendment to my yes, motion. And Jan, is that an okay Good. friendly amendment? Okay. Is there anyone um, from the public wishing to make a comment on this motion? No? Okay. Anyone else? No? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. That do you need to appoint the members to that committee now? Do you want us to do that in a separate <laughs> yes. motion? Okay, can we have a motion to uh, appoint the members of the committee that were stated? It's been established uh, in previous discussions who the chair is going to be, or is that going to be discussed? I, um, I would hope that it would be the mayor. Okay. <laughs> I move that we appoint uh, the mayor, the vice mayor, and Councilman Smith as the three members of the committee with the mayor as chair of that committee. Second. Okay. Um, anyone wishing to make a comment on that motion? No? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, at this point, uh, I have one person who has signed up to make a comment um, at the end of our meeting here, and that is Brother Christopher. Please come forward. Public comment uh, um, is open to anyone, and you have three minutes to um, to say whatever it is you wish to say, but that does not include what we have already worked on earlier in the evening. Nashville City Council, Madam Mayor, greetings from me and from the Lord. Everybody would like to start out with a new slate. Unfortunately, technology today, that's very hard, almost impossible. But the Lord has told me to tell you, as far as this council is concerned, it's new. Everything of the past is done. Am I here to bless you? Am I here to curse you? No. But what must you do to be blessed? Well, one, be like Solomon. Because God is now saying to you, just like he did him, ask for anything you want. You could ask for riches. You could have asked for power. You could have asked for richness. But he didn't. Here was a young man talking to youth, given a whole kingdom, a great kingdom, a powerful kingdom to rule. He didn't think of himself he thought of the people he was going to rule. So he said, God, give me wisdom. And because he thought of others, God gave him riches beyond any other. God gave him wisdom beyond any other. God gave him everything he needed. So what does God ask of you to ask for wisdom? Now let me explain something. The same man who got that wisdom wrote down this. But the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. 
And right now I'm having a debate in my church about what is the fear of God. Everybody wants to go, oh, it's just awe of God. And I keep trying to say, well, no, it's fear, trembling. And then I tried to be a good politician and compromise. It's a combination of the two. You know, because sometimes in the Hebrew, we pick one word over another, but it's a combination of two. <laughs> and today the Lord said, look up the word awe. Dreadful fear is what awe is. A fear that restrains. Look at our society today. We are a society that proclaims no fear, no restraint. Treat all people equally and show no favoritism. That means whether it's a rich person here, poor person here, or middle class person here, you treat them all the same. And seek not dishonest gain. If you'll seek what God has for you, he'll give you what you truly need. <laughs> I needed a computer. God's been blessing me. What you'll receive is wisdom from God. And hopefully a couple more seconds. Discernment, peace, and honor amongst the people of this city and other cities. How do you receive the curse? Treat other people with dishonesty, partiality. And what is the curse? He's going to take your sleep from you. He's going to take your finances not only of this city, but yours. It's going to hit you where your pocket lies. I remember one time I said, someone on this city council is going to okay, get wait, it with sorry. a tree. <laughs> We're up for debating a motion. <laughs> Thank you. I know, but I've been patient too because I've I noticed you've been talking. That is part of respect. I respected you tonight. From this point on, I only ask for the same thing. Thank you. Um, I understand that we have some representatives. Wait, are we missing something? Brother Christopher, did you leave something up there? Uh, we have some representatives from East Asheville here tonight. Um, and it is possible, I will tell you, that if you have three people to yield their time to you, that you can speak to us for 10 minutes. Would you like to do that? Okay, do you have three people? All you have to do is raise your hand. Are you yielding your time? One, two, three. Okay, now if you yield your time, you don't get to talk. Okay? All right. So you'll have 10 minutes and just state your name, please. My name is Kim Martin Engel, and I live at 19 Bull Mountain Road in East Asheville. Um, good evening, Mayor Manheimer, council members, city staff, and public. Um, I am speaking tonight on behalf of the East Group. Uh, EAST stands for Economy, Assets, Safety, and Teamwork. And the EAST group focuses on issues relating to East Asheville. The mission of the group, uh, just in summer, we, we have a bigger mission uh, that is on our website. Um, but the mission is to identify and beautify East Asheville. And in trying to accomplish this goal, uh, safety has also become a priority for the EAST group. East began as a sidewalk initiative and was very successful working with the city and DOT to install sidewalks along Tunnel Road from the 240 interchange east to exit 55. East Asheville residents are certainly very grateful for the sidewalks, as evidenced by the many folks that are out using them on a daily basis. That said, more needs to be done to create a tunnel road that better balances the needs of both drivers and pedestrians. A corridor study would enable residents and city staff to create a shared vision for how we want this critical roadway to evolve. We believe that the city working with the stakeholders in East Asheville can create a boulevard entrance into and out of downtown Asheville. Successfully done, it could be a model that other cities could use for best practices in design and function. At present, the perception of many drivers is a roadway designed for speed. Tragically, since November of 2012, two pedestrians have been fatally injured on this very corridor. At one time, the intersection at Tunnel, Newhaw Creek, and Crockett was determined to have the most accidents in Buncombe County. After the two fatalities happened in 2012, the Transportation Department asked the East team about our safety concerns for this road. We met with Ken Putnam and other city staff in February of 2013 to draft some improvements East thought could be made. 
We feel this outline highlights the urgent need to complete a corridor study, but as of yet, no follow-up has happened from the Transportation Department. The mayor, city manager, and council can see a copy of our safety concerns we addressed with the Transportation Department in the packets that I have with me tonight. I plan to get them to you ahead of time, um, but my schedule did not allow for that, so I will give them to you after. Uh, we've also included a map in this packet that highlights some of the problem areas along this corridor. Furthermore, East is extremely concerned about the building of the new Whole Foods Market shopping complex on South Tunnel Road. It will result in increased traffic, both pedestrian and auto, along Tunnel Road. All the more reason to plan ahead for the future of this already congested area. Since the beginning of the sidewalk issue, this group of residents has always had a bigger vision in mind for this part of town. But that means we need help from the city to conduct a corridor study. East has been working in conjunction with the city on this issue since 2011. We are here tonight to express our frustration and to ask for your help. This project, the Tunnel Road Corridor Study, was presented to Council for approval by the East Group in February of 2012. Council approved the Tunnel Road Corridor Study and East was working with city staff, including Julie Fields, Nate Pennington, Judy Daniels, and Marcia Stickford until staff was reorganized within the city, resulting in no longer having any involvement from the city. At our last meeting um, that we held with the city, uh, the East Group asked the city member um, if the perception from the city was that our group was not organized enough. And the answer to that question was no. Um, and that the reason the city staff was no la longer able to work with us was because of the reorganization within the city. Um, but that the city would let us know when um, things were settled, who would be working with our group. Uh, we are still waiting, and we feel that we've been extremely patient. It's been over two years. One of the things that the city asked our group, the East group, was to organize a group of stakeholders that would work on the Tunnel Road Corridor study. Members of East went door to door along the Tunnel Road Corridor, gathering input from property and business owners regarding a corridor study. Terry Albright, Mariana and Bill Bailey, and myself collected this information. Our group finally gave up, as it seemed to be putting the cart before the horse. We couldn't garner support for something that seemed to have no leadership or direction from the city. However, we did at that time send all of our contact information with an outline from a visioning and brainstorming session to J Judy Daniels at that time. It seems that there may have been a misconception from the city staff about East Group being disorganized. We have been meeting consistently every month as a core group of concerned volunteer citizens for over two years, which shows perseverance and determination. As a team, we have identified and created a map of the east boundaries that our group is focused on, initiated a mural project, a Facebook page, a website, and desirable design concepts for this corridor. We have gathered and documented community support from business owners and residents in East Asheville, resulting in a petition that was submitted to Council on April 2nd, 2013, that outlined our concerns. East is currently in the process of adopting this very section of Tunnel Road through DOT's Adopt a Highway program, which I believe also shows a deep commitment on the part of this group. I believe our dedication is evident and has been demonstrated. Back in May of 2012, we received a draft proposal for the corridor study, which led us to believe this, that this project would be underway long before now. But yet, nothing has been done by the Transportation Department or by the city towards this effort. As underscored by a recent comment that Mayor, previous Mayor Bellamy said as she spoke at the Festival of Neighborhoods. She said, I don't hear a lot from East. Well, I'm here tonight to tell you that we've done a lot of work as a group, again, of volunteers and concerned citizens, and we're prepared to do more work. 
We are just asking for your help now from the city to move the Tunnel Road Corridor Study project to the top of the list and to address the safety issues we presented to the Transportation Department. Thank you very much for your time and your attention to this extremely important issue. Thank you. Can I give these packets? If you hand them to Maggie. Is there anyone else here who hasn't yielded their time wishing to address council? No? Okay. Um, do we, I know Judy's here. Do, do you want to address the status of the East? Gotta be a better name than that. Hi. Um, I, I, first of all, I feel kind of bad because Kim indicated she had sent me that vision materials and I don't have it. I didn't get it and I feel terrible if she sent it and it didn't arrive because we would be happy to start processing those thoughts, definitely. Um, regarding their efforts with the planning department, we did start the effort um, we, with the understanding the community was going to have to do a lot of the work because we didn't have much capacity in the department, it, so it would have to work like Haywood Road which has been very community driven effort. Um, and then they were getting going and trying to get their work together. And in the meantime, um, we had a uh, reorganization and lost staff capacity. And uh, we would be happy to work with them, but we don't have much ability to do more than attend their meetings, give them guidance, and slowly move it along. That being said, She's correct. It is important for the city to start thinking about Tunnel Road because I agree that the fresh market uh, will have a substantial impact on traffic in that area and desirability of that area as a place to live. <coughs> um, that Tunnel Road East has been one of the areas the Planning Commission is evaluating and staff in terms of presenting and use some priorities for future form-based code corridor study efforts. So that's where we are on it, and we applaud their continued interest. And um, I do think, though, for the, com the complexity of what they're looking for now, and I can't speak to Kim Ken's involvement, um, we probably are going to need a consultant to help us uh, if we wanted to move that on a faster basis. And I'm sorry, Ken's not here for the rest uh, of it. Would it help if we put this in the queue at the PED committee to have the committee focus on it a little better and and, and elevate it there absolutely okay so the suggestion has been made to to refer this to the planning and economic development committee which is a subcommittee of council where um, if we're going to do a corridor study or a corridor overlay rezoning or something like that you would find that project initiated in the PED Thank you, Judy, for making those comments. And um, for example, we just we, we're in the middle of the Haywood Road rezoning project, um, which did require funding and an outside consultant, and that was birthed out of the uh, PED and then approved by council. And that's been a very successful endeavor. So um, <coughs> I think to to gel this up to understand exactly what what we need to do on the city's part and what the neighborhood would like. We, we should probably start with the Planning and Economic Development Committee. If, if you want to come forward to the microphone, I think that would be helpful. I think what the concern is here is based on the comments that you have provided, it's not exactly clear what it is that you're asking City Council to authorize or move on in terms of um, being responsive to your request and we're trying to make sure that we are fully understanding the request and the priorities within the request and exactly you know what's a cost money thing to do would it require a budget um, uh, you know some funding uh, or is it a reallocation of staff resources uh, or, or what the case may be and to, to have a full discussion about that and come up with sort of a, a to-do list it would be better to handle that within the committee. Okay. Um, one of our members, uh, Terry Albright, presented in front of PED, and we have 
a full draft proposal that I, I did not make copies of due to our lack of resources, funding resources, and making copies and, and doing the work that we do um, is all just from our, you know, ourselves. Um, and Terry did present in front of PD. We have a full proposal of, um, you know, an outline and, and sort of all that you just said. Um, so I guess it, it feels like we're going back um, and yeah, we need. Can you tell me concretely exactly what it is you tonight you're asking for? Uh, city staff again to work with us, ah. um, <laughs> and specifically with regard to getting the corridor study Com happening to to complete the corridor study. Yes. Okay. So, and I think what I'm hearing from staff is we don't have the staff. We may need extra resources to do that. And, and then the second component was the transportation mm -hmm. component, um, which I think w we can, Ken Putnam is not here, the director of our transportation, mm -hmm. I think we can relay that request to him. I think since what's happened is that there was a plan in place, it's been disrupted, we now realize we have, I think what we're hearing is we've got s some staffing issues and may require uh, additional resources. I think that it it would be appropriate to revisit this so that we can get get back on track and determine what you need and what what we need to do to facilitate that um. and, and just to be clear I think what you see happening here is this council is directing staff to put it in the queue for PED to help us analyze understand so that when it comes to PD it's not simply going to be you guys coming to PED and starting over it will be staff work you know, looking at timelines and strategies so that when we talk about it at PED, uh, we, we're further along than we are tonight. And I, I'm, I'm the designated chair of PED and I look forward to that happening. We, we do rely on staff to help us line up um, items for various agendas, so it may not be the very next PED meeting, but uh, we'll rely on staff to work with you guys and help us understand when that'll be. It will be within just a few months, but maybe not the very next meeting. Fair enough. And you, and you also mentioned you emailed um, something to Judy, and it apparently didn't get there. Can you resend it, or um, and also feel free to um, include City Council if you want to, in case you know there's some kind of um, filter or whatever, okay. maybe blocking it. Yeah, it was probably two years ago, so that information, it's it's hard to go back, um, but. Yeah, well, if we can possible. gather, I mean, yeah, in any way, sure. it won't dis it won't disturb the process of it coming okay. back to PED. Okay. I appreciate you coming Thank forward you. tonight, so that making us aware of this. Thank Mayor. you for your time. I, yes. Just uh, uh, Kim. Also, I want to uh, applaud you all and everybody else that's come here. I know you've been at this for a while now, and I know it's tough to kind of sometimes get traction on these ideas here. But I appreciate the fact that you're staying with it and and keeping after us to help you. Because uh, you're right, uh, East Asheville and Tunnel Road is evolving and it's going to change a whole lot more in the near term here. And I think it's real important to get ahead of this question here of how we, how we want the community to grow and how that. So I appreciate what you're doing here and we'll try and do our part to help it keep moving forward as well too. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I think I already asked if anyone else had a, um, would like to make a comment tonight. Anyone else? All right. Um, with that, we have we, we need a special motion because we're not. This isn't over. It's going to continue. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor, this is a motion to recess. As the as the public knows, we we often meet in closed session for a variety of things. Uh, there's a certain topic. It is a closed session type to topic that uh, just because of inconvenience, we're not able to address tonight because of the need for certain people being present. But um, my motion, therefore, is to move that. This meeting, the Tuesday, December 10th, 2013 meeting of City Council, recess until a week from today, Tuesday, December 17th, 2013, at 3:30 p.m. in the Council Chambers on second floor of City Hall. Right here, the anticipation is we would go immediately into closed session. There probably would not be much in the way of open session activity that day. So there's my motion. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All right. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 